Hi, SBC Church family. I can't believe that we're already in session five of our series, Major Stuff from the Minor Prophets. Well, again, there's some controversy about exactly when Joel wrote, with scholars citing evidence in support of a date closer to the time when the Assyrians were the leading world power, in other words, around 800 BC, as well as when the Babylonians were the major power, around 600 BC. As stated before, which of those is actually correct is not of great consequence to our study, but the dispute is something that we need to be aware of. Joel's name means Yahweh is my God, or Yahweh is God. I alert you to that because it indicates that he was likely raised in a home in which God was honored. Some scholars even believe that he served as a priest because of his frequent mention of priests three times in chapter 1, verse 9, verse 13, and 14, and again in chapter 2, verse 17. That said, he also showed interest in agriculture. So maybe he was a farmer. Well, none of that matters quite as much as the fact that he was a prophet of the Lord. In Joel chapter 1, verse 1, we read this. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Joel has earned a variety of nicknames as a prophet. Among them are the prophet of the rent or the torn heart, the prophet of revival, because Joel saw that genuine repentance is the foundation of all revival. He is also called the prophet of the Pentateuch because he includes 25 references to the books of Moses in his prophecy. And then there's the prophet of Pentecost, which is another name given to him due to his prophecy in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 29, a prophecy that was quoted by Peter in Acts 2, verse 17 and 18. By now we know with absolute certainty, however, that however you wish to refer to him, or whenever you choose to position his prophecy in time, Joel was one of the pre-exilic prophets to the southern kingdom of Judah. Natural disasters, from rising floodwaters to violent earthquakes, provoke fear and dread. With all of their resourcefulness, people still cannot control those powerful and destructive forces. They can only watch in awe. Joel begins his book, his prophecy, with a description of such a natural disaster, a plague of voracious locusts. Listen to what he says in Joel 1 verse 2 to 4. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten.
Have you ever witnessed a locust plague? I haven't and I'm glad I haven't. But I'm told that only those who have can fully appreciate why it's so dreaded. Apparently, Joel could not have used a better springboard to announce the day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord and even worse judgment to come. In the prophet's hands, the destructiveness of the locust invasion became a vivid warning of the power of God's coming judgment and a clear appeal to run to the Lord for mercy. Listen to extracts from Joel's description of the havoc that was wreaked by the locusts. In verses 5 through to 7 of chapter 1, he told the drunkards in the land, Weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Speaking to the land in verses 8 to 10, the prophet remarked, The field is wasted. The land mourns, for the grain is ruined and the new wine is dried up. The oil fails. The address of verses 11 to 12 was leveled at the farmers and the vine dressers. The harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered. And then according to verse 13, even the priesthood was affected. Gird yourself and lament, you priests. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Friends, things were pretty rough in Judah. Not entirely unlike what some are experiencing in our present challenge. The locust plague had taken Judah to the brink. It had destroyed her livelihood. But Joel announced that things were going to get worse. Rather than the people seeing the end of the plague as the end of their troubles, Joel wanted them to realize that they should anticipate something more severe. In Joel 1 verse 15, he tells us, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Well, I mentioned previously that in the New American Standard, the exact phrase speaking of God's pending judgment, the day of the Lord, is used 28 times in the Bible as a whole. 17 of those references can be attributed to the minor prophets. And of those, five can be accredited to the prophet we're studying today, to Joel. It goes without saying then that the day of the Lord was a crucial element of Joel's teaching. While later prophets expanded on our understanding of the phrase, James Smith notes that eight elements are part of the day of the Lord from Joel's perspective. Yeah, they are. The signs and wonders in heaven. The day of the Lord, which is eschatological, in other words, is future, as well as historical, present and past. Great judgment that is associated with that day. The final defeat and punishment of God's enemies. The ultimate redemption of the remnant of believers. The prominence of Zion or Jerusalem. Yahweh's triumphant and peaceful reign. And then lastly, the finality of this consummation. Friends, if you take a careful look at that list, you can see that while the day of the Lord undoubtedly involves God's judgment, it also contains elements of blessing. That's perhaps best seen in the eschatological or future day of the Lord where the prophets speak of a time of unparalleled judgment and suffering during a period known as the tribulation as well as a time of blessing beyond our imagination in the thousand year reign of Christ and of course beyond. While well, following the judgment of the locust plague, Joel's concern in verse 15 was the immediate future. The coming judgment which God had revealed to him was imminent. Well, after lamenting the extent of the locust devastation in the closing verses of chapter 1, in chapter 2, the prophet hones in on the judgment element of the day of the Lord. 
The first 11 verses of our key chapter describe this time in graphic and terrifying detail. We don't have time to read all the verses, so again, let me provide you with some extracts from Joel's prophecy. Even at this late stage, God demonstrates His grace and His mercy by warning His people beforehand and providing them with one last opportunity for repentance before bringing judgment upon them. Look at what it says in Joel 2.1. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. A trumpet or a ram's horn was used in ancient times to signal that danger was near or to warn of a military attack. As we read those words, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Could you sense the tension? If you could imagine yourself in that audience, how would you have responded? Well, Joel tells them that the call for repentance unheeded will lead to calamity which is what he proceeds to launch into in the verses that follow. In verse 2, he describes that day as a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. He speaks of a great and mighty people. And then in verse 3 tells us that they are like a fire that consumes before them and that behind them a flame burns. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them, it is like a desolate wilderness. Nothing at all escapes them. In verse 4 and 5, Joel communicates that they move swiftly, running like war horses. They leap on the tops of the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire consuming the stubble. Verse 6 says, before them the people are in anguish and all their faces turn pale. Verse 7 to 9 speak of how easily the city's defenses will be breached. They run like mighty men, says Joel. They climb the wall like soldiers. They burst through the defenses. They rush on the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. And then verse 10 and 11 tells us, Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. The Lord utters His voice before His army. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed a great and very awesome day. And who can endure it? Many years ago, we used to sing a song based on those verses. Some of you might know it. It went something like this. They rush on the city. They run on the walls. Great is the army who carries out his word. They rush on the city, they run on the walls. Great is the army who carries out his word. The Lord utters his voice. Listen, before his army. Can you hear it? The Lord utters his voice. Before his army. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Blow the trumpet in Zion, Zion. Sound the alarm. I figure that that melody was just a tad on the jovial side for what Joel was really communicating. This was not something to be keenly anticipated, but approached with fear and trembling. Friends, the verses that follow will not only serve as our key verses, but they also form the basis for our key or spiritual thought. Listen carefully to them and contemplate their significance to you as well. Listen to what Joel says in verses 12 through to 14. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting, weeping and mourning. And rend your heart, not your garments. Now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, and relenting of evil. Who knows 
whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, even a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. See, when God told Judah, return to me, it's obvious that they had to turn away from something else, namely their sin. Their actions had to be authentic, though. They couldn't be like a naughty child who grumbles a half-hearted, sorry, to a sibling they've hurt, or who reluctantly and mechanically obeys a parent to avoid the painful consequences of their disobedience. Their return to the Lord had to be from within, with their whole heart, with fasting, so as to be alert to the Lord's conviction and leading. And Joel tells us with weeping and mourning, so as to demonstrate that they had heartfelt sorrow over their sin. See, God wasn't interested in them rending their garments, which is a common demonstration of sorrow at the time. What he wanted was rent hearts, broken hearts. The former without the latter was meaningless. If the people were sincere in their repentance, Joel says they would find God abounding in grace, compassion and loving kindness, ready to forgive, willing to stay his judgment upon them and even open to dispensing blessing to them. Friends, I've repeatedly seen people trapped in their sin who have expressed sorrow over their sin. In reality, they weren't sorry for what they'd done, the damage they'd caused to themselves and the pain they'd inflicted on others in the process. They were sorry they got caught. Sorry they'd been confronted by a brother or sister in Christ. Sorry they'd been disciplined by their church family. Sorry that there would be consequences if they continued to swim in the same cesspool. But they weren't truly sorry. They were half-hearted in their repentance. They rent their garments but not their hearts. They never bothered to ask God for forgiveness. And they simultaneously neglected to make things right with those they'd sinned against. Maybe that sounds like someone you know. Maybe that sounds like you. If that is you, then you have got to purpose to set things straight. First with God and then with your fellow man. Well, after some instructions in verses 15 to 17 on what Judah had to do to further demonstrate genuine repentance, there is a very notable transition that takes place in verse 18. And it continues all the way to the end of the book. As a result of her repentance, God promises restoration to Judah on three fronts. Physical restoration in chapter 2, verse 21 to 27. Spiritual restor restoration in that same chapter, verse 28 to 32. And then lastly, national restoration, which makes up the whole of chapter 3. You know, Joel has already given us a ton to think about, to chew on. But in closing, let's consider just one lesson each for life and leadership. Here's your lesson for life. What is our biggest danger when life is going well? In answering that question, I want you to take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10 to 12, because it was a warning issued to the nation of Israel when they entered into the promised land. And then there's our lesson for leadership. A challenge to the pastors, a challenge to those of you who teach. Have we, like Joel, communicated the urgency of heartfelt repentance to the church? Friends, I trust that, like with the other prophets, you have been challenged like I was. I hope that you enjoyed your time together, but more importantly, that you also grew through this time as we studied the prophet. Joel, before I let you go, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the book of Joel. Uh, Father, I could uh, literally feel uh, an, an emptiness, a, a nervousness, an angst uh, in my heart when I read about the judgment that was to come upon the people of Judah. And yet, Lord, we learn that you are slow to anger that you are kind, that you are compassionate, that you are forgiving. 
Father, that you are willing to bless if we come to you with hearts of genuine, not just remorse, but repentance. Father, leave those sins that we loved before. And Father, I pray for that man, that woman who's out there that right now is struggling with a sin, that's caught in a sin, that may even be justifying such a sin. I pray, Father, that they would heed the warning of Joel to the people of Judah and show heartfelt repentance. Father, that they would not rent their garments, that they wouldn't put on an outward show of sorrow, but that there would be a genuine heartfelt repentance and that they would demonstrate actions that follow upon that. Father, give grace, give strength, Give mercy, for it is needed in abundance. In Jesus' name, amen.